Hi, everyone. Welcome to another ShareWise webinar. Today, I am joined by Tom Wickenden, who is an investment strategist from BetaShares. Thank you so much for joining me today, Tom. No worries. Thanks for having me, Caitlin, and, and good morning, everyone. So today, uh, Tom is going to take us through a presentation on the basics of ETFs, and then we will have time for you to ask him any questions that you have on ETFs and beta shares in general. Um, to do that, you're welcome to put in questions through the Q&A chat box down below throughout his presentation or after, um, but I'll hand it off to you, Tom. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Caitlin. I'll just share my screen on the presentation here quickly. Cool. So... Hopefully everyone's got that on screen yeah. now. So yeah, the, the presentation today, we'll be covering a bit of ETF 101, uh, but also uh, answering this this question that I that I posed in a in a research piece I did recently about you know how, how the ETF did we get here? How did the ETF industry get to be a you know 150 billion dollar industry in Australia, which is where it sits today? Um, but before we do get into all of that, just firstly, uh, importantly, all the information I give today is general in nature. You know, I don't know any of your personal circumstances, so none of this is, is financial advice. And just quickly on beta shares ourselves. So, you know, we're, a, we're an Australian founded and run uh, ETF provider. You know, we've been in the market for around 14 years now. Uh, and we've amassed about $30 billion in assets under management. So we sit in second place behind Vanguard in terms of the ETF industry. Uh, we've got the most number of ETFs on the market, 84, which um, you know, can be hard to hard to keep up with even for us here at BetaShares. Uh, and then quite proudly, we actually service over 1 million Australian investors. So one in every 10 Australian investors now invest in, in one of our ETFs, which is um, just pretty exciting for us. So the ETF industry as a whole in Australia, as I mentioned, has seen you know, quite significant growth. Um, the first five or so years in the EDF industry, we only saw about $5 billion um, come in. But in the last you know, 15, 15 years, we've seen about $145 billion come into the ETF industry. Um, so it's been obviously a really exciting place to be, to, to work, but also I think for investors, a really important um, trend to, to be aware of and, and to make yourself aware of ETFs and, and why we've seen this growth in ETFs. Uh, before I jump into you know what's contributed to all of that growth, um, just taking a step back to what actually is an ETF. Um, I guess for the benefit of those who don't know, I, I'm just referring to them as ETFs, but ETF stands for Exchange Traded Fund. Um, so if we think of it at the most simple level, it's a fund. Now, when we think of a fund, that's typically a, you know, an investment vehicle that invests in more than one asset. So you're not just buying a single share or a single bond. You're buying a fund of shares or a fund of bonds that are exchange traded, i.e. you can buy and sell them on the exchange. So I guess the most common exchange for, you know, for the viewers here would probably be the ASX, the Australian Stock Exchange. So all 300 and, geez, it must be close to 370 ETFs now can be bought and sold on the Australian Stock Exchange, just like you buy and sell a share. Um, so you can probably straight away think of some advantages just from even seeing that image. There's the advantage of diversification. You know, if you buy a single share or, or a single asset, you know, you have quite a lot of, you know, stock specific risk. Whereas if you buy a, a fund or an exchange traded fund, um, you've got the benefit of diversification amongst a number of assets. Uh, these assets are typically related. Um, you know, an ETF will typically track an index. Um, they can be actively managed too. Uh, but a bit later in the presentation, we'll get into the different types of ETFs and, and how they select their underlying companies that, that you ultimately invest in. In terms of the actual functioning of an ETF, so one really important distinction to, to understand is the open-ended nature of ETFs. Um, when you're buying an ETF, it's important to understand that you're buying a unit value um, that represents the fair value of the underlying assets or the underlying shares or the underlying bonds. I guess this is important because you don't want to buy, you know, that basket of companies at a premium for more than you could buy the individual companies for. If you think of a single stock, for instance, to, to use a simplified example, if there's lots of demand on the market for a stock, since there's a, a limited number of 
shares issued by the company, that will drive the price higher. Now, with an exchange-traded fund, you're buying units in the fund. Now, if we use the same example, there's lots of demand for the units in the fund. Rather than necessarily driving the price higher due to that high demand for the ETF itself, what uh, an ETF manager can do is buy more of the underlying shares and issue more units. So in doing so, if the fund is trade or trades around that fair value of the underlying companies. Sure, if enough people wanted to, you know, there's tons of demand for an ETF and the ETF provider bought lots of the underlying shares to issue more units, that, that could in theory increase the price because the underlying share prices increase. Um, that's just more the, the functioning of the trading and, and pricing of an ETF, which is really important to, to understand. The second one I've already touched on a little bit, but they're exchange traded, which is which is pretty great. Uh, you know, back back in the day before ETFs, if you wanted to access a, a fund, you typically had to access an unlisted fund. That could mean a lot of paperwork. That could mean it takes a long time to get your money in and take your money out. Um, being exchange traded means you can buy and sell, you know, units in an ETF on the ASX just as easily as you buy a stock. You've got, you know, T plus two liquidity, so you can buy out and set, buy in and sell out very easily. Um, with no additional fees around that than your than your normal brokerage fees that you would um that you would pay. The third one's around cost effectiveness. Um, most ETFs, and again we'll, we'll we'll get into this in more detail, but most ETFs are, are tracking passive indices, um, and doing so is is quite a lot cheaper than you know paying traditional actively managed funds or paying traditional active managers. So, you know, since there is this um, relationship or there's been this historical relationship between the growth of exchange traded funds and the growth of passive index investing you know etfs are typically thought of as being typically low cost um, and having lower fees and finally and this final point is actually really really important and particularly for anyone who is new to etfs or wants to learn more about etfs etfs are really transparent and a great place to learn about any etf is the issuers website um, so our website, for instance, or, you know, there's other big ETF providers like Vanguard and, and iShares. If you go to any of our websites, you know, you can find all the ETFs that we have listed on the exchange. And each ETF will have its own little fund page. And it's got really good information there, like the, the underlying holdings uploaded daily. So you know exactly what you're holding, um, the methodology it's using to invest in the underlying assets investing in. So it's, it's, it's very transparent. Um, all the fees are there, et cetera. So, you know, as you dig a bit deeper into you know, your ETF investing journey, that's a really good place to to go after you understand the high level information. On that, that's that's most of the ETF 101 I was going to cover today. I was just going to mention on our website too, we've got some complimentary ETF learning courses. Uh, these are really good. They've been put together by our marketing department and they take you through all the basics of ETFs. There's you know, seven or eight lessons there. So you can skip ahead or, or move back when you need to. Great little videos. So I um, highly recommend it for anyone who, you know, is newer to ETFs or wasn't across some of those concepts I just covered. Um, in terms of the, the main presentation today, we're going to cover different types of ETFs uh, and how these different types of ETFs have contributed to the growth of the Australian ETF market. Uh, so starting off with what I've labelled the bedrock, and those are broad equity index ETFs. When most people think of ETFs, this is typically what they would think of. You know, these types of ETFs are like your ASX 200. So, you know, BetaShares has an Australia 200 ETF. And by buying a unit in that fund, you're getting exposure to the top 200 companies listed on the ASX. Um, these are passive index funds. They're usually very, very low cost. Like that A200 fund I mentioned, that's, 0.04% per year is the fee on that. So for $10,000, you're paying $4 a year in a management fee. So really low cost. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, the growth and popularity of ETFs really came about as a, at, a, at a similar time to the growth and popularity of passive index investing. And what this has meant for, you know, across the globe, and, and Australia is no exception at all, that these this style of ETFs, passive low-cost core ETFs make up the vast majority of the Australian ETF industry. Um, you know, of the 10 largest ETFs in Australia, 
Um, seven of them would be classified or, or classify themselves actually as core index funds. And those seven funds make up 30% of the total Australian market. So, so a huge amount of money is in these core passive ETFs. Um, before we get into some examples of those types of ETFs, just quickly, you know, what is key for the core of a portfolio? You know, when we think about the key building blocks for a portfolio, we think about asset allocation, you know, we want to be ex buying or we want to be using funds that can give us true asset class exposure. You know, for the core of our portfolio, we probably want Australian equities, some international equities, some fixed income, maybe some property and some cash. So when you're constructing the core of your portfolio, the things you put into those different asset class buckets, you really want them to provide the asset class exposure. So for a lot of investors, you know, watching this webinar in particular, um, you know, for your Australian equities, you might use direct shares, for instance. You know, we're Australians, a lot of us pick our own direct company shares. But for the international part of our portfolios, look, some of us might buy direct international shares, but you want to have really good coverage in the core of your portfolio of international shares. So this is really a role that ETFs can fill um, because they typically do provide really good diversification and good asset class exposure. Um, they're designed to be held for a long run. They're, they're quite low cost, uh, which is very beneficial. Um, and, you know, using these types of building blocks together in the core can help to reduce overall volatility uh, and benefit from diversification. So just to give a few examples of some of our, you know, core index ETFs, the first column there I already mentioned earlier, which is our Australia 200 ETF, A200. And simply by buying a unit of that on the ASX, you get an exposure to the 200 largest companies listed on the ASX. Um, if you're looking for, you know, a, a global portfolio, we've got things like our global shares ETF. You know, and underlying this fund, there are 1,500 equities from over 20 different countries. So by buying a single unit in that, you get really good broad diversification uh, internationally. Uh, the NASDAQ 100, some, some of you might, might recognize, it's one of the, the most popular indices in the world. That's another example of a core, core passive ETF. And finally, we've got our all growth ETF, which is actually quite interesting. This is a, um, an ETF that has exposure to Australian equities, international equities, and emerging market equities. So it can really be, new, be used as a you know, all-in-one portfolio, um, portfolio piece. So then... I guess we've, we've kind of talked about the, the growth of, of passive investing and how that makes up the bulk of ETF AUM in Australia. Um, the second largest category for assets under management are active ETFs. Um, so active ETFs, those are ETFs that are managed by a you know, professional or investment active manager. I guess important here to just make a distinction because some people do um, think of ETFs just as the, the passive, you know, index tracking ETFs. But an ETF, an exchange traded fund, is really just an investment vehicle. So you can have a passive strategy, you can have an active strategy, you can have fixed income or bonds under it. It's just an investment vehicle that um, has become quite popular due to its efficiencies. Now, when we look at active ETFs, as I mentioned, they account for, or they, they're the second largest category of ETFs in the Australian market and account for about 15% of the assets under management in Australia. There's quite an important distinction to make here, though. So although the assets under management for active funds, you can see, or if we, let's, look, let's look at the chart, actually, to start there. So you can see there's been, you know, fairly significant growth and also periods of, of um, decline for active ETF AUM over the past five or so years. When we count the assets under management of active ETFs in Australia, it's important to understand that when a traditional unlisted active manager converts their unlisted fund to an ETF, that also brings the assets over with it. So that huge jump you see in around November 2020, that was a particularly large active manager converting their unlisted fund to an exchange traded fund. And what that means is it didn't mean lots of investors bought it on day one. It actually means as those assets came across, that boosted the assets under management for active ETFs in Australia. Um, and it's a trend we're, we're going to continue to see. We're seeing lots of active managers convert to ETFs just due to the efficiencies of the structure. 
um, and because of the growth we've seen in ETFs. But what's really important and um, I guess an important consideration is converting to an ETF alone doesn't mean you'll, you'll get info. So if we look over the past three years, whilst the number of active ETFs has more than doubled, there's actually been outflows from active ETFs on the Australian market when we don't account for those, you know, that conversion of AUM across, um, which is quite interesting. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail in this presentation on this, but just to talk more broadly about, broadly about why have we seen this trend into more passive ETFs than active um, or more passive funds than active in general, there's some really good research that S&P do. Um, they do it out of the US, but they do it for Australia as well. Just looking at the performance of active managers against you know, passive benchmarks over the long term. And what they typically find you know, is that active managers, especially once you go out to longer timeframes or, or the majority of active managers, when you go out to, the, to, to longer timeframes, typically underperform um, equity market benchmarks. To, to help hone in on this, we can focus on one line here, so the black line. So what that black line on the left graph is showing you is, okay, over a one-year period to the year end of 2022, um, how many actively managed funds managed to outperform the passive benchmark? And you can see that that 50% line would be 50% of active managers. So about 40, uh, 45% of active managers actually underperformed um, the passive benchmark over a one-year time frame in 2022. Um, and if a lot of you remember to the start of 2022, you know, we, we see it quite often, but a lot of articles saying this is the year for active management, this will be active's best year. We're actually seeing a lot of those articles pop up again now. Um, but time and time again, the research tends to show that majority of active managers underperform, especially when you look at a longer time frame. Um, the percent that even outperform drops off a lot more. Um, on the right hand side, there, as an example, we've got our Australia 200 index ETF against five of the largest active uh, managers um, and their performance over that five year time period. And you can see, so over five, pit, five years, in the left-hand chart, about 20% of active managers outperform the benchmark. And in the chart on the right there, you see about um, one or one out of five or 20% of the active managers managed to beat A200 net of fees. Um, so that's just more, you know, why we're seeing this trend towards passive funds over active. Um, and it is a huge trend. Um, what I've got here is I've taken uh, from the data the flows we've seen into just, this is just core passive ETFs that we touched on earlier versus all of the active ETFs uh, listed in Australia. So, you know, both core and both fixed income. And you can see this huge trend of inflows into passive ETFs. And, you know, it's fair to say, you know, historically up until about 2021, we did see some some inflows into active ETFs, uh, but more recently quite a, quite a few outflows out of active ETFs. Um, in saying that, you know, beta shares, we, we, we do run um, active ETFs as well in conjunction with professional managers. Um, you know, our, our thought process behind active ETFs is there are particular asset classes and areas of the market where active, you know, can add value. Um, it's just a lot harder for active, active to add value in certain areas like, you know, broad Australian equities or broad global equities. Um, for instance, you know, one of our largest funds actually is our, our hybrids ETF, HBRD. Um, and, you know, the hybrid market is, you know, typically more nuanced, more, can be more inefficient. So there is, you know, the opportunity for active managers to provide alpha there. So moving on, um, the next category I want to cover was smart beta ETFs. Because I guess it, it poses the question. So, you know, there's there's a lot of interest and a lot of growth in passive broad market ETFs. Historically, you know, investors have looked to active management to try and generate alpha. You know, it's, it's very normal for investors to want to outperform the index, outperform the benchmark. But if we're saying most active managers aren't achieving that, well, where can we look to for outperformance or alpha? Um, and one area is potentially smart beta ETFs. So I'll get into the definition of a smart beta ETF in a second. But first, let's think about, you know, what a active manager's investment process looks like. Um, step one is a lot of, you know, they'll take a universe of stocks and they'll do a lot of quantitative filtering. 
you know, what are the most profitable companies? What are the companies paying the most sustainable dividends? And they'll typically filter down to a you know a pool of 300, 100. This is obviously a generalization. Um, but from that, that filtering process, they'll then use their stock picking selection. A smart beta fund does step one. So it does this filtering process typically, but it doesn't undertake step two. So I guess the question is, once that filtering process is done to find, let's say, the highest quality companies or the best value companies, um, once that's done, are active managers adding alpha by individually picking stocks out of that filtering process? Um, and a lot of active managers would say, uh, yes, they are. And, so, and some, you know, we saw the, the stats earlier that they are outperforming the benchmark in some ways. Um, what we've got here is an active manager versus the Miski World X Australia. So the Miski World X Australia is a very broad index, has no filtering process, has no screening. Um, you can see the active manager has provided our performance over this index over the time period. Um, I guess the question I want to pose is, are active managers always using the fairest benchmark? Um, so the... The selection of this active manager, and there's more after, were the again the five largest active managers in this space. Just to just to kind of qualify um, the results, but um, I guess the question I want to pose is: Are active managers always using the most appropriate benchmark? So, if you're a quality active manager picking the highest quality stocks, is it fair to benchmark yourself against you know a broad a broad indice that doesn't have any filtering, or could there be more appropriate benchmarks? such as a quality style index, that'd be a more appropriate benchmark. And you can see, you know, the, the, the correlation in beta of the beta shares quality index ETF and the quality active manager um, are even more similar than the active manager and the benchmark they have chosen. I um, mean, actually just using a quality factor index that's, you know, passive, so not taking on extra active manager fees and not attempting that stock picking process may actually provide you know similar results to what you would typically expect from an active manager over the benchmark but you know a, a, a quality etf and we, i've kind of touched on this through the presentation but if you look in the bottom right chart there typically does this at a significantly lower fee um, and as we've seen um you know it can outperform the active managers so this kind of talks to this, this style of ETFs called smart beta ETFs. Um, just going back a second. So what I've got here, just to give an example, this is that, you know, filtering process we do for the QLTY fund. So it's a, a rules-based process, it's completely transparent. So investors can see what we're filtering for. Um, we end up with those 150 companies, that basket I kind of alluded to, an active manager would end up with. We, we then just, you know, we, we balance them based on market cap with a 2% stock cap. Um, just to give an idea of how you can do that process in a rules-based manner. Um, and those types of ETFs, so quality factor ETFs, value factor ETFs, even equally weighted ETFs, they, they're smart beta as well, um, is, a, is a really um, fast-growing segment of the ETF market. So these smart beta ETFs now make up about 11% um, of the assets under management in the ETF industry. And it's an area that I personally expect to, to grow more going forward as, as investors accept the benefits of rules-based approaches uh, and the performance they can provide, particularly at lower costs. Um, yeah, I think that's all I want to cover there. So what I wanted to talk about next was thematic ETFs. And I've written the surprise there and we'll, we'll get to that um, in a bit. Thematic ETFs, I think it's fair to say they garner an outsized uh, amount of media and attention. Um, you know, if you think back to those core passive ETFs, they make up what was it? Those top seven make up you know thirty percent of the of the industry. Um, thematic ETFs make up about three percent, so it's actually quite a small portion of the ETF industry. But in saying that, they are really good tools for investors to use. So when I talk about a, or when I mention it thematic ETF, what I'm talking about is an ETF that's tracking an index that's giving exposure to uh, typically a you know future growth thematic or, or a specific area. So things like cybersecurity, things like green energy um, come to mind, electric vehicles, 
these thematics, there are ETFs that track indices that hold companies in those different sectors. Some of the benefits of, you know, investing in those types of companies and, and indices is they typically have, you know, above market, sorry, long-term above market growth opportunities. Um, they can be used to replace, you know, particular alpha generating strategies that active managers have, because again, they typically can be lower cost. Um, and one of the benefits, particularly of a, an ETF that tracks a thematic. So of course you could pick an individual company in cybersecurity or an individual company in electric vehicles. I guess the benefit of a thematic ETF is that diversification story. You get access to a, a broader range of companies in that thematic, um, which means, you know, in these industries, there can be a lot of stock specific risk. Um, so you, you play the field rather than trying to pick an individual winner. Um, and so this is just giving an example. So a traditional company, uh, a more mature company typically is quite cyclical uh, and will you know, have earnings and revenues that ebb and flow throughout the economic cycle. Um, so for example, like a healthcare ETF or a, or a banking ETF or an energy ETF. Whereas a thematic ETF, typically you, you would expect these thematics to go through you know, a structural train, change growth cycle. Um, so you know, early on, there's the, you know, the early innovators and early adopters. And you, know, you typically see growth that's not as leveraged to the economic cycle. It typically grows as there's more um, uptake of a you know, particular thematic or thematic company. A, a really good example of this is Microsoft. Um, you know, back in or pre-01, they pretty much had their enterprise software you know, they've invested heavily into cloud computing, uh, more recently in the media machine learning and AI, into search as well. Um, and you can see that if we compare the revenue growth of Microsoft, uh, you, know, a, you know, more of a thematic style company historically, compared to a more traditional company, you can see that the you know, revenue growth is fairly steady compared to the ebbs and flows of ExxonMobil, the energy company that typically yeah, ebbs and flows with the uh, global business cycle. Uh, and so as I alluded to before, though, you know, thematic ETFs don't make up too much of the market in terms of assets under management, uh, but they do still play a really important role in investor portfolios. Um, and, you know, they typically pay a, you know, typically play a smaller role in portfolios. They're, they're trying to add how far they're, they're typically a higher risk. So there's higher return there. Um, but that could also allude to why they don't take up as much of the ETF industry as many might might expect. And look, the final area I wanted to cover were fixed income ETFs. Uh, fixed income ETFs, particularly over the past 12 months, uh, 12 to 18 months, have become really popular. Um, you know, the fixed income market in general has become very popular as rates have increased, um, you know, as interest rates increase, as as yields increase, and we can see here, I've just got the yields on, you know, di different government bonds and, and different fixed income securities from, you know, a few years ago to now. And you can see this huge material increase in the RBA cash rate. That's even higher now, actually. That was, um, that was this was pre the last rate hike. Uh, in government bond yields, that's the kind of the indicative return you're getting from buying, buying government bonds. And the very right-hand side, we can see the earnings yield of the S&P 500 and the ASX 200 haven't moved uh, nearly as much over that time. And what's that? What that is saying, in simple terms, is the relative um, the relative benefits of investing in fixed income compared to equities uh, has grown quite substantially. Um, and so, with this, we've seen a huge growth in interest for fixed income uh, and fixed income ETFs in particular. Uh, this is actually quite an interesting stat I came across. The last time the Australian government bond yield was at 5%, which it hit a few weeks ago, um, there were no cash or fixed income ETFs available in Australia. Uh, today, we have about 53. So last time fixed income markets were trading where they are or around where they are now, there was no option for investors to buy fixed income ETFs. This time around there are, and we've seen quite a strong preference for fixed income ETFs. Like what I've compared here is you know, listed fixed income ETFs versus unlisted fixed income ETFs. This includes both active and passive. And you can see the typical trend has been for inflows into fixed income ETFs and outflows out of unlisted fixed income 
ETFs, which the, the exception of those last few periods where we saw strong inflows into, into both areas. Um, and yeah, just to, I guess to give some context, so the last 18 months we've seen, you know, $8 billion inflows into fixed income ETFs and $12 billion outflows from unlisted ETFs. So I guess investors, again, showing their preference for, for a listed exchange traded fund and, and that um, investment vehicle. In terms of, again, in terms of its um, place in the ETF uh, industry or AUM, um, particularly the past few years, we've seen quite a steady increase. So the past 12 months, about 56% um, of industry net flows have come through fixed income ETFs. Um, and quite proudly, we've been the number one uh, in terms of inflows into fixed income over that period, taking in, I think it's north of 50% of those flows. Um, just to give, I, I don't want to go into too much detail here, and, and Cognizant, it's already been half an hour as well, but um, just to give you a bit of an idea, there's, there's different um, pillars and different types of uh, fixed income funds. Um, what's probably you know quite um understandable to a lot of investors is, is cash and money market ETF. So so what I've got here, this, this won't be uh, intuitive off the bat. These are just ticker, ticker codes of some of our fixed income ETFs. In the, on the next slide, I have the actual names. Um, I don't want to obviously cover these in, in any particular detail here. As I mentioned on the website, there's lots of information. This is more just to give investors an idea of the different types of fixed income strategies they can invest in. So cash and money market, that's you know typically at call cash or very short dated treasury bonds. That's like your, your bank account, really. Credit income, this typically talks about, you know, sources of income. So from bank hybrids, um, from floating rate notes that don't take on a lot of um, interest rate risk or don't have much, typically don't have much volatility uh, or price movement uh, related to interest rates. Um, sorry if that's uh, technical. Uh, traditional fixed rate bond indices. So these are your traditional bonds that you know will have their prices impacted by movements in interest rates um, and have their interest rates move move higher um, as interest rates move higher. Uh, and then finally, inflation linked bonds. So we, we've got quite good coverage across all of these styles of ETFs. And again, if, if it's an area you're interested in, I, I'd really encourage you to look to you know our website for for more details on those. Um, again, I just wanted to put this in here because I put the Ticket codes in the previous slide without much context, but I might um just skip past this and then you know if, if you're interested you can you can jump back on the um on the recording to see what these different ticket codes uh, relate to. So yeah, just I guess in conclusion to sum all of that, we've seen incredible growth in the ETF industry both globally and and here in Australia, uh, particularly here in Australia over the past you know ten or so years. Um, it has typically coincided with, you know, this growth of passive and index investing funds, but investors' appetite to outperform markets, which historically have been thought of to be done through active managers, is still there. And we're seeing growth in areas like smart beta ETFs because of that. Um, and also just the greater accessibility ETFs have given people across different asset classes. When we see periods like we've seen more recently in the fixed income markets, um, investors can now look to ETFs um, for different asset allocation decisions. Uh, just finally, before we get into some questions, um, a few risks on screen here again. I won't read these all out, but um, I guess it's important to note, you know, all the information today was was general in nature. Um, and I've kind of alluded to this, but there's lots of good resources uh, on our website as well. If you're interested in ETFs, you know, that that's, um, the presentation today was actually based off a, an insight that I put on our insights page a few weeks back, um, exploring all of this in more detail. So, you know, if that type of thing is of interest to you, please do jump on the website and, and have, a, have a look around. But with that, I might um, throw back to you, Caitlin, just to cover off any, any questions. Thank you so much, Tom. That was such a good overview of ETFs. And I know that we had a lot of um, new investors here today that wanted to learn more. So thanks for that. In saying that, let's get straight into the questions. I wanted to ask you, you talked about the core ETFs in the beginning. Is there always a positive correlation between these core ETFs and the market in general? Uh, in terms of their, okay, I see. So like kind of in terms of their growth. Yeah. The yeah, that's true. The so when we look at assets under management, there's two key drivers of assets under management. That's going to be 
net flows, so inflows and outflows, and secondly, um, the actual movement of the underlying market. Because if you've got money in a broad market ETF, uh, even if no one buys or sells, if the if that ETF increases in value, so will the assets under management. Um, so that's true of all the all the different um, styles or, or, or classes of ETFs we talked about today. Um, so I guess yeah, it's important to look at the AUM, but also net inflows and outflows. Like a good um, example was the, was the active example, right? We've seen AUM grow for active managers, but the net flows have actually been have been negative, which is an interesting way to think about it. Right. Yes. Thank you. And um, I have a question here. What are your thoughts on a Bitcoin ETF or just the crypto market in general? Yeah, I um, the crypto market in general, I'm not too across it. We actually we do have a crypto specialist at BetaShares, um, and you can, if, you, if it's an area of interest, you can subscribe to his newsletter, uh, which you can find through our website. In terms of Bitcoin ETF, we we have a crypto innovators ETF. Now, this doesn't invest in you know an underlying coin itself. It invests in companies um, that kind of service the crypto market. I think it's inevitable that a Bitcoin ETF will be listed here in Australia. We have seen the listing of futures-based uh, Bitcoin ETFs in Australia already. Um, not on the ASX, um, but I do think in the not too distant future there there will be Bitcoin uh, future or spot probably probably spot I would suspect uh, ETFs listed on the ASX, but there's obviously a lot of you know regulatory hurdles to whoever would would want to do that. Mm. And um, I wanted to ask, how often do the ETFs? respond to the market like for example if a particular holding experiences a massive volatile drop do mm -hmm. you guys immediately sell no i guess that's, that's a really really good question and that comes back to the you know type of etf so that, let's just focus for this answer let's focus on a, a passive index tracking etf so a, an etf that just follows a rules-based methodology um those indices are typically rebalanced every quarter so four times a year. Um, let's use the ASX 200 as an example. So, you know, a Australia 200 ETF or our Australia 200 ETF is holding the 200 largest companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. So on a quarterly rebalance, the index provider will calculate what those companies are, how much weight to give each, and then we'll, you know, rebalance our portfolio to make sure we have that, that balance. Now, let's say a company, company 190 that we're holding, has a huge drop, it'll, it'll be in our portfolio, uh, but let's say it drops out of the top 200. Well, then on the next quarterly rebalance, when we the index um, provider recalculates the weights, that company would likely have fallen out of the top 200, another company would have come in, and that's when you would rebalance. Now, this differs across um, all ETFs, and as I mentioned, there are, of course, active ETFs, so active managers could, could buy and sell whenever they wanted to, um, but yeah, for your typical passive broad market ETFs, it's quarterly. But what's great if that's um, you know of interest to you, as I mentioned on the on the fund page website, um, you can see the full index methodology for these um, passive index ETFs. So it's it's fully transparent as to when and and how that happens. And um, we have a question asking about the percentage management fee on NDQ, which is um, your NASDAQ beta uh, ETF. But before yeah. we get into that, can you actually explain what the management costs are and how this impacts investors? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good question. Um, so the management feeds and costs are what the fund provider will charge to manage the ETF. Um so for some ETFs, like if we look at A200, um, it's got a really low fee because it's fairly easy for us to manage that ETF um, and the underlying costs, because we have to, you know, the ETF provider has to pay people like the index provider to track their index. We have to pay for our operations, our portfolio managers to, to make do the rebalances. So those costs kind of build up and they're put in the management fees and costs. That's what makes them up. Um, I think that answers that part of the question. The second part of the question, the fee on NASDAQ, I've, I've got it on screen there. So that's 48 basis points. So $48 for every 10,000 invested per year. Hmm. And um, I think 
for those who are more interested in the specific management fees, they can go directly to your website. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly right. So just like, you know, all these other elements I've said are really transparent. Uh, the fees and costs for all the ETFs are, are on the website there. Mm, okay. Well, with that being said, um, I think we'll end it here. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining me today. It was really, really interesting. And um, for those who want to rewatch this, we'll be posting it on our YouTube. But thank you so much, Tom. No, thanks so much, Caitlin. And thanks everyone who, who came along to watch. Thank you. Bye.